electric car, and that's been the case for a while. We're now uh, the same thing with our ferries and uh, short haul ships, and uh, you know, increasingly with heavy traffic. And our industry is uh, very eager to be in the front of the carbonizing uh, process industry, for instance. Secondly, we work closely with the European Union uh, uh, and Iceland, where we have uh, where we are part of the European Green Deal, as it's called, uh, which is sort of a you know the most comprehensive transition of of the economy anywhere. And thirdly, we are, as you hinted to, we are also assisting uh, developing countries and and emerging economies in a faster transition out of fossils. So we are actually trying to uh, change the whole energy system of the planet. But then, as you also indicated, we are we're also the major exporter to Europe and, I, and, and the same European Union or the same United Kingdom uh, that uh, wants to go clean over time. They would be rather unhappy if we told them, you know, by tomorrow there's no more new gas. So go back to Russian gas or, or look elsewhere. We, we also think it's strategically important that we upheld these deliveries while there is still use. But we also work for the elimination of use, right, or the transition of the use of natural gas for instance so so i mean it i mean this comes well together uh, but it would what I, I would be very unhappy if we were an oil producing country trying to fight for the continuity of oil we don't we actually think oil has to come to an end and the emissions have to come to an end but it has to be a holistic comprehensive transition and at cop 28 i actually started my morning by discussing with uh, sultan al jaber uh, who's the president of the uh, designate of COP28 and my good colleague uh, Grace Gu from Singapore and the two of us with Sultan Adyabo will work on exactly these issues as we move towards an at COP. How can the world manage its energy transition? And Norway wants to be not only a part of it, but a leading uh, uh, player in that transition. Mm -hmm. So when do you think Norway will start producing oil and gas? Well, first, I think that the future of gas will last longer than oil. Oil, uh, well, there will still be oil for non-energy use, of course, because oil is so important for many industrial products. Uh, when, but when we talk of oil as energy, that is largely something that goes to the transport sector. And the transport sector is quite advanced now in decarbonizing. That We know that electrification and in the future, hydrogen, ammonia produced in clean ways will be able to take care of much of what was what we use coal for. Natural gas is a different question. That natural gas is used for much more than electricity production. In electricity, it can be replaced mm -hmm. over time, but for the moment, it replaces coal in many places. Uh, but in the future, of course, renewables will replace gas. But it's also used for heating in many European houses. It's used for uh, cooking. It's used for uh, fertilizer production. It's used as a feedstock in industry. So, so. In this energy transition, we it should happen sooner rather than later. But the 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 demand side and the supply side have to move forward together, uh, because I think an energy transition and a green shift that upends everybody's life uh, very much uh, will also risk uh, triggering counter forces. So we want to have an ambitious. Uh, forward-looking uh, energy transition and green transition towards a more renewable, more circular, more nature-friendly economy. But we have to have people with us on that in that transition, and this is very much the key question here. So for some more years, but uh, but we are approaching. You know, we're we're beyond peak, and 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 uh, and we are very much aware and even happy to say that you know oil and gas will gradually be a smaller part of our economy. And then we want to replace that with all those new opportunities that comes precisely because oil and gas is going down. So why build battery factories? Well, precisely because cars will run on battery electric on electricity through batteries rather than oil. Why invest in CCS? Why invest in hydrogen production? Why invest in green shipping? It's because the energy transition happens, and there is where we find the new workplaces. Mm -hmm. So Norway recently offered vast areas in the Arctic for oil and gas companies to explore. So why are you continuing oil drilling in the Arctic? You know, why not stop it there? Well, actually, frankly, there is not much oil drilling in the Arctic. Most of the mm -hmm. actual drilling that takes place for new resources are in areas adjacent to existing areas because the companies mm -hmm. themselves uh, put the priority on just filling in. Uh, let's, for instance, talk about natural gas. We have a very comprehensive uh, uh, infrastructure of pipes 
that goes to the UK and to the EU, to the, technically to the Netherlands and, and Germany, but then distributed into the uh, EU. And it's much smarter and more cost efficient uh, if you find uh, new reserves of natural gas in adjacent fields. So that's the main priority. Yes, mm -hmm. there is some exploration basically to find out what are their resources, but it's been relatively disappointing from the oil company's perspective and maybe encouraging from the environmental perspective. There is not that much to be found up there. So it's basically around where we already are because we know that the volumes will gradually go down. So that's that's the main priority. Mm -hmm. Many countries are having windfall taxes on oil companies on oil companies because of huge profits caused by the, the Ukraine war. How about a windfall tax in Norway? Well, I mean, we have a very heavy taxes. We have a 78% tax on the revenues of oil. We, we, um, uh, when, when you, as an oil company, start earning money, uh, you keep 22% and 72% goes to, 78, sorry, goes to the state. So, so that's, uh, uh, serious taxation that is and all, all of that money uh, every single kroner or euro or dollar goes into our sovereign wealth fund uh, and uh, where, where it's kept and we only take out uh, a part of the uh, sort of annual growth or the annual interest of the sovereign wealth fund so so i would say that uh, we have uh, definitely windfall taxes on, on oil as it should be and we've had that since the 1970s it was an integral part of our system uh, the company still want to operate because there's still quite a lot of profit, even if 78% is taxed. So Norway's emissions of greenhouse gases have fallen by uh, just 4.7% from 1990 to, to 2022. So how will you cut them by 55% by 2030? On the face of it, it sounds impossible unless you essentially shut down the economy. Well, I, frankly, I don't think so, and the, the, uh, it, it is possible, and I'm quite convinced that we will. I mean, we will definitely do our best to do so. Uh, I am convinced that we will achieve the climate goals that we share with the EU and Iceland, uh, because that includes the European uh, carbon uh, uh, pricing system, ETS, for instance, and, and, and that means that everything that comes with the European Green Deal also affects to us, and that's a systemic transition where we do not only transition our own economies on our own, but also together, it's, you know, which means that when when our process industry wants to sell parts to a German car maker, which is quite a typical case, that German car maker needs to report on its carbon footprint and they will then prefer to buy, for instance, aluminium from Norway, which is very low uh, emission and, and so on. So you create an economy where doing the right thing actually makes sense in the economy. Uh, but so so a lot of this happens to actually uh, use you know managing speeding up the transition of transport industry housing building construction agriculture and so on and on top of that we very much believe that we need carbon capture and storage but we will not uh, achieve these goals if we do not also for instance on uh, waste management introduce uh, a, a solid element of uh, of ccs so but 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 you but you're absolutely right. Four point seven percent of um, since 1990 is way too little. Uh, even if, of course, it has to be said that the economy doubled in that time. So the the the, the carbon intensity has gone down tremendously, but not enough. So we need to speed up. And uh, for that purpose, as of last year, uh, this government introduced an annual green book, which is a an part integral part of the state budget for the next year saying this is how it went last year this is what these are the climate initiatives that we take this year across government in all fields and this is how next year fits into the road to 2030 and that gives us a very honest and thorough uh, document in which to and invite parliament invite the media invite the you know the public debate into seeing how are we doing and and i my my strong ambition and our strong ambition as a government this is something our prime minister speaks proudly about many times is that this is the instrument that we lacked that we do not only occasionally come up with a white paper from my ministry but that we have a whole of government uh, commitment to actually reducing emissions and then you know some emissions are reduced you know day by day uh, so the, the more electric cars the less fossil cars for instance mm -hmm. but then you have these sort of large emission cuts which is when Yara in uh, Porsgrunn and uh, towards the south of me here, when they uh, move 
into green ammonia rather than gray ammonia production, that itself takes out of several percent of the total emissions of Norway. And that will happen. It is happening. It's just that it happens on that day. It doesn't happen, you know, little by little. It happens when that when that starts. Likewise, mm -hmm. when we have CCS on our major waste plants, the day you turn it on, emissions are reduced. It's not happening gradually, but in, in large steps. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions coming in from the audience. So let's take a look. Um, so first question is, um, which type of renewable energy do you think holds the biggest promise globally? Globally, I think it's uh, solar, uh, uh, followed by wind and, of course, uh, hydro where possible. Um, uh, I, but I think that, you know, what we really see the acceleration now is solar also because solar can be installed in what we call gray areas. It can be installed uh, into buildings, infrastructure that already exists. So uh, it does not necessarily compete with uh, another major goal, which is preserving more of nature. Um, but we also need to recognize that as we move to an increasingly renewable energy system, we will have need several sources because the, the sun does not always shine. And of course, you can store electricity at a certain point. But, but the optimal outcome is that you have several different sources and you connect them to each other and you connect them to an advanced modern grid. Uh, um, and and we, because the, the, the first 20 percent is much easier than the last 20 percent mm -hmm. as we move into this and you need some kind of stabilizing uh, uh, efforts as well. So so uh, the future energy systems of Norway and Europe and the world uh, will actually be o over time less expensive than what we do now because all of these sources are intrinsically much cheaper than fossil. However, to get there leads a lot of investment, lots of permitting, lots of planning, and an ability to operate much more advanced grids than we do uh, today. And, and uh, I think much of, the, much of the sort of forefront of research on energy is not only about how to produce enough energy, but how to make sure that we have enough of it when we need it and at the right place and time. And, and that, that, that's about storage, it's about management, it's about energy savings, it's about prioritization. Because we need to recognize as a civilization that we will have to relate to scarcity in ways that at least we in rich countries haven't. And I'm not speaking about scarcity of money necessarily or good life, but the scare, but there will we have to prioritize how many new resources can we take from nature, what can be circle circulated rather than taking out new. Uh, the energy needs to be clean, so we have to not only introduce the new, but also phase out the oil. That we will not, we will have energy enough, but will not have abundance. So we have to make priorities and so on. So, uh, you know, we need to develop political economic systems that are able to make these priorities and get them right. And that's, I, you know, when I think about 2050, when the world is to become carbon neutral. I say, uh, I think we will make it, but if we fail, it's not because of the engineers and the technology, it's because politics failed and because something mm. happened where this became impossible to convince people to be part mm. of. Um, another question just came through, a uh, really, really great one too. Um, if you could guarantee significant action on climate change from one other country to make the biggest impact, which country would it be and why? So if I could guarantee, well, it's hard for me to guarantee for all the countries, but I would, I mean, I, I think, of course, the largest economies, India and China, uh, maybe starting with China with, for the moment, um, they are actually, uh, in a sense, both uh, the worst and the best, because they, I mean, they're still invest in coal plants. Uh, admittedly, it should be said they're also closing down the old ones and replacing them with newer and relatively cleaner ones, but they still invest in coal. But they all also invest more in renewables in one year than every other country on the planet combined. So, so they are a little bit of both. But of course, we need the commitment of the really large economies. Uh, we are now thankfully seeing much of that happening uh, increasingly in China, but also in the US because of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. And, uh, uh, and Prime Minister Modi just concluded a relatively successful G. 20, where they also are pushing for language on uh, upscaling of uh, renewables, for instance, which, which is also there. So, so, of course, in order to make this a success on the planet, we need the really large economies to be involved. But uh, all of us have to do our share because this is really a global task. And 
you know, the more we recognize that the future is circular renewable and more nature friendly, uh, the, the more investors, innovators, uh, politicians, planners will also steer their efforts in that direction. And suddenly you will have sort of a positive lock in effect, not a negative one, but a positive where, you know, one process takes the other. And eventually this is where money goes. This is where all the bright kids coming out of our best universities go and so on. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, but I mean, I would say India and China need to deliver as well as we do. Um, we we talked. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the uh, the success Norway has had in uh, you know having uh, electric vehicles on the road, um, and so you know the country is planning to halt sales of new petrol and diesel cars from twenty twenty five, five or ten years earlier than many other rich nations. Do you think it will work? It's looking good, actually. Um, the uh, I mean the, some of the last figures I saw is that we're approaching we're approaching ninety percent of new cars fully electric, and almost all the ten or fifteen percent left is hybrid, uh, which is will now be phased out. But we're, we're now we're taking away the tax benefit for hybrid. It was an important uh, transition technology, but now with the sort of extensive uh, charging infrastructure we have and and sort of solid access to electricity everywhere in the country. Uh, we think the future of cars, personal cars, will be all electric. So, so it's looking good. Um, it's not like we, it's not like a prohibition after 25, but uh, but the sum of tools, including taxation and ta all, so will making it so meaningless to continue to be fossil that people will, you know, be encouraged to choose electric, and uh, and that seems to go quite well on on personal uh, on small cars. And then what we are now do, started doing, uh, working very closely with the Ministry of Transport, is that we launched a charging stra strategy for heavy, for trucks and heavy vehicles, because they cannot charge from the same chargers. Uh, the, uh, you need sort of even more electricity and you need more space, literally, because a semi-trailer, of course, takes more space than a Tesla uh, on, the, on, on the charger. And, and, and this is a way to go, but we're, we're developing the infrastructure. And what we've learned is that in the beginning, it was uh, tax breaks or sort of tax benefits and uh, and certain other benefits, so access to the bus lane and so on, and, and cheaper parking, cheaper uh, tolls. Uh, but eventually, uh, this became the car of choice as when people saw that their neighbor had one, the neighbor recommended it, they found it actually it's much, much cheaper in use, much less repairs. Uh, people are now installing solar panels. And I, I just spoke to a farmer the other day who said that he had enough electricity from his roof uh, that he basically drove for free for the rest of his life and just buy the car and then there's no no price for driving because he got it all at home and only very occasionally and this guy does not live in the city lives in the countryside uh, said that very very seldom he had to stop at the charger because his car his car took him 600 kilometers uh, and that's the normally didn't go much further well so of course I mean it's attractive. yeah yeah, so I mean, it shows how you know you have been very successful, more than anyone, promoting electric vehicles, and that anecdote just you know just shows it. Um, so I was wondering, what would you say to other leaders in other countries facing protests, um, such as you know low emission zones in London or the yellow vests in France, who who are trying these climate measures but are facing op popular opposition? What would be your advice to them? So I think my advice is to take it seriously, engage with the people who are worried, but try to find solution that helps them. I mean, it's um, uh, if, for instance, shifting to an electric car is very expensive for some strata of the population, make it more accessible. Try to make sure that you know that you have a desire to transition. Make sure that you have uh, you know solid. Uh, public uh, transport, where, where, wherever that is an alternative, which is not everywhere, I know. Uh, and, and try to see if can you combine social justice and fairness with the green transition, because it, it, it's not, you know, you must not, we must not accept the idea that uh, so-called so normal people are inherently fossil. It's, it's actually more about making the green opportunities available for everybody and not just the middle class. And we've seen some of it ourselves. We actually introduced, we, we had no tax, no VAT, no nothing on electric cars. Uh, a few years ago, we started saying there is now a VAT after roughly 50,000 euros. Then you start paying VAT, but only for what exceeds 50,000, because we realized that we were subsidizing 
you know, Porsche Taycans, which were, you know, compared with half the price of a similar fossil Porsche with the same, you know, performance or better. Whereas sort of a sort of lower end car did not have this, it was still an advantage, but much less of an advantage. So you need also to manage this in such a way that you recognize the social dimension. And I would say coming from Norway, the geographical dimension, it can be done. But, but, but I think it's really to engage with these people and say that we will make the green transition work for you in your life and not something that is uh, urban middle class uh, uh, requires a lot of economy. And if we get that wrong, I think we'll see a lot of uh, backtracking. And um, we are getting more, question, more questions from our audience. Um, um, the IEA 1.5 degree aligned scenario says there is no room for new fields. Uh, how does Norway square this with its plans to develop new fields? Well, you see, they, I I, uh, I work very closely with Tati Birol and IEA, and I think that what that, what that report says, uh, it's a, an excellent report, which I've read thoroughly. It says that we, if we have the most massive build out of renewables uh, in history, you know, a, a really, 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 not double down, but, uh, you know, quadruple down on, on, uh, uh, on uh, clean energy, uh, we will very soon be in a point where you don't need more uh, fields. That's correct. Now, the problem is that when you talk about uh, uh, petroleum and, uh, and fossil fuels, there's also a very strong geopolitical element. There is today a desire that while Europe, for instance, still wants to buy gas, they have a preference for buying gas from friendly allied countries. And so even if there are resources, for instance, in Russia, that's not the resources they want. So there are sort of more to it than that. But on a global level, if we, if we, if we look at the globe as a totality, uh, I think that we basically have found uh, 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 an amount of petroleum that is equivalent to what we need, but not necessarily in the right place. Some of these fields that we know about will not be developed because they are in the wrong place. They're very far from infrastructure. They're far from the market. So, so I think, again, an energy transition needs to have a very strong, ambitious goal on the outcome, which is a zero emission energy system but also a degree of realism about the complexities to get there. And then that also requires a strong will to invest in renewables, but also to invest in the technologies that means that we can use renewables. Because as you know, it doesn't really help to have electricity in the charging station if your truck is still a diesel truck. You need both the, the charger and the truck. Uh, but likewise, it doesn't help to have the first uh, ammonia-driven uh, long-distance ship if there's no ammonia in the harbor. Uh, so, so you have a lot of these chicken and egg uh, issues and that we have to address uh, domestically and internationally through sort of significant cooperation, not only between countries, but also between sectors. And on the way there, there will, uh, I would say, unfortunately, but there will still be some use of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, but we need to work towards a serious transition now. And that's what I really hope that we can advance now at this coming COP that I also already mentioned, that between let's stop everything tomorrow and fossil fuels forever. The reality is, yes, we need to face down and then out uh, everything that has emissions with it, but that requires this complex set of measures that makes that possible on the supply side and the demand side. Since you raised COP, it's a great time to talk about it. So um, uh, what are your expectations for the COP28 summit? What needs to happen in your view? Well, you know, this is the first so-called global stock take. So it has a particular role uh, in Paris. Uh, we decided, which was in 2015, uh, uh, we decided that when we're midway to 2030, because, you know, when in Paris, 15, obviously there was 15 years to, to uh, 2030. Now we're, we're exactly at half point. And the decision was that at half point, which is this COP, we will take stock of where we are. Now, of course, we all know more or less where we are. We're not at all where we should be. So that's already known. But we want to do that. The idea is to do that in a more formal setting that actually with serious scientific background from IPCC and so on, uh, collectively say we need to speed up, we need to do more and identify what we need to do more of. And Dr. Sultan Ali Abur is the COP president and the UN secretary has been very eager to say that this has to be the COP that seriously addresses energy transition. We have, in a sense, been dodging that a little bit. Uh, we had some uh, good a good start in Glasgow, 
uh, two years ago uh, in the in, under the UK presidency, um, where at least we started to discuss face down and coal and so on. Um, uh, then not so much happened on that front. All the, all the good things happened, but not so much on this front in Sharm el Sheikh, which was yes, last year's COP. I have great expectations that we will deep dive into this question. And remember that the G7, uh, the sort of the most uh, industrialized uh, Western countries, uh, agreed uh, only a month or two ago that the language should be a strategy to phase out all unabated fossil fuels. Uh, G20, which includes many of the emerging countries, did not copy exactly that language, but they took part of it with the focus on the strong increase in uh, uh, in renewable energy and renewable energy use. And all of this leads up to a COP that has to address this issue. And uh, I have the rather challenging task together with uh, my colleague from Singapore, with whom I worked a lot before in other uh, similar international settings, to try to steer that discussion into a, uh, into a good outcome. And I, I hope for the best, of course. Do you support Sultan al Jaba holding the presidency? Oh, absolutely. I think I mean, he, uh, the, we have a rotating system uh, uh, in the UN, uh, and uh, Dr. Sultan Ali Aber has gathered an excellent team, and they're working really hard. I met him uh, uh, actually this morning, uh, last time, and we, we, we speak frequently about it, and it's one of the best prepared cops uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, there is a discussion that he is uh, uh, also, in addition to being a minister, he has uh, two CEO positions, one in the large oil company and one in the largest renewable company in the country. Um, but I think that uh, he's, he's very much aware of that discussion, but I think that has inspired him to be even more forthcoming on saying that he wants to keep 1.5 alive. He wants to have a systemic effort to reduce emissions by 2030 in accordance with Paris, which means 43% planet-wide. So we Western countries say 65, but planet-wide 43. And he, he repeated that as late as this morning that you know we we need to be serious about this so so uh, we support that as a normal un procedure and uh, what is important is what we get out of the cop and the fact that countries who have been involved both in 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 petroleum and in renewables and uh, in uh, it's absolutely necessary i mean we, we really need to have everybody on board to understand at depth uh, what the ambition must be, but also what the challenges are in getting there. And what do you think of the branding of the summit as an oil cup? Uh, I don't think this is an oil cup. I think this is a UN uh, climate uh, conference. And uh, I think involving businesses of all kinds, not uh, specifically oil, but I mean, businesses in, who in one way or the other are involved in the energy transition and the green transition is uh, something we should do. It, it's of course governments that negotiate and only governments. Uh, that makes the formal decisions, but to, to have a constant dialogue with uh, labor unions and industries and uh, business at large, investors, banks, I mean, that is, this is necessary and, and a good thing. Many environmentalists, such as Greta Thunberg, have expressed their disappointment with COP climate meetings. Uh, they've said that, they, in their view, they've been talking shops while greenhouse gas emissions globally have continued to rise. What would you say to them? I would say two things, um, and um, I would say there the two things are uh, framed by they're partly wrong and they're partly right. And I'll start by partly wrong. The partly wrong it came out very much in the there was um, uh, last Friday a week ago last Friday as a major document came out from the UN Climate Secretariat, which was sort of the the background paper for the global stock take. And the first thing it says is that. Um, uh, emissions are way down compared to where they would have been without climate policies because the the link between economic growth and uh, and emissions growth has been broken and many particularly the most advanced economies they grow economically and they cut emissions and and they very systematically more than i've seen before say climate policies works uh, big time in the sense that we would have been in a totally different place if we didn't have climate policies and the COP. So that's the partly wrong part. But partly right also, because having said that, of course, we need to cut emissions much more. And we need now to move from uh, from sort of incremental change, optimizing processes uh, to deep decarbonization that go deep into the industry. Let's just take an example, because a lot of emissions come from large industry, process industry, for instance. 
in, in my country, process industry has reduced 40% since 1990 its emissions, and they produce more. That's great. But what they have done is by being smarter in using electricity and more modern machinery, modern technology. So that's sort of incremental change. Next phase is to go into the core process and take out uh, coal as a reduction material, for instance, or make sure that all the energy is clean and so on. Then you're into the deep decarbonization phase. So, so the Greta Thunberg and her generation is right in demanding much more. But I would not. But I would advise them not to overlook that uh, without the cooperation and without all these investments, all the change in banks, investors that we have seen, uh, that they don't recognize that it would have been way worse if we did not translate absolute certainty on climate science that emissions are human induced, and we know why, and that transform that into policy. So, so it's a the glass half full, and uh, the job now is to fill it up. And one of the initiative that Norway has done uh, in recent years to, you know, to, to help has been to, you've been the main funding partner providing cash into the Amazon fund, uh, yeah. which funds Brazil's effort to halt deforestation of the rainforest. So we're now nearly a year since uh, Brazilian President Lula da Silva retook power. So how's the work on preventing deforestation in Brazil going in your view? It's going incredibly well. It's incredible how much has changed after Lula came back. And we, I actually had, you know, I met President elect Lula when he was elected, but not yet president. Uh, it was actually during the Shaman Sheikh meeting. And we discussed uh, the fact that uh, we had had to close uh, the um, Amazon fund because of the uh, decisions made by uh, former President uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, and I said, we would be very eager if we agree uh, on uh, re-establishing the governance mechanisms that was scrapped by Bolsonaro. If you do that on your first day in office, we will then also reopen the fund. We thought there was actually quite a lot of money there, most of them Norwegian, some German, and now a lot of other countries are coming on board. And he agreed and we made the plan. We sent a team to Brasilia and literally on his very first day in office, he did exactly what we agreed, and we did exactly what we agreed, and now the fund is up and running. And they have reduced deforestation tremendously. There are numbers, there are different analyses. So the first one I saw was 42% down in deforestation. Others were even higher. Uh, let's see when we have the final verified results, but there seems to be a significant reduction in deforestation. And that's thanks to Lula himself and his brilliant uh, environmental minister, uh, Marina Silva. Uh, and the fact that this is sort of a core priority for Brazil. And not only that, President Lula has worked with President Petro in Colombia and all the other uh, leaders of the region. And they just had an Amazon summit saying that this is a shared responsibility of the countries uh, uh, living in the Amazon, which is the largest rainforest and therefore the largest carbon sink on the planet. And so if the Amazon de deteriorates and disappears, which could happen actually, because it's a very complex organic, so at, at some point it would start going into savanna. That will be a tragedy for the planet, not only for Amazon countries, but for the planet. Likewise with Indonesia, we've seen a significant uh, improvement uh, and, 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 and radically less uh, deforestation under President Jokowi. And we're also working with good partners in the Congo Basin. And Norway has really been a great power here. We're a major contributor to these efforts. And why? This is not offset. It's not something we, uh, none of these tons are put against our NDC. We still want to cut our emissions, but we just believe that we cannot leave to relatively poorer countries to do this job on their own. We, the rest of us have to follow up. And I'm really happy to see that key partners is the UAE, the US, the European Union, the UK, several others have now come on board saying we want to help this and we want to take this example of northern wealthier countries assisting countries uh, like Brazil, like Colombia, like Indonesia, like the DRC or uh, in, in Africa to, to do this job together. It's their country, but they are doing a service to all of us. What, and, and let me just explain, the, in order to get to net zero, we need both to reduce emissions and to keep and preferably increase the sink because net zero is emissions minus uptake. So emissions will never be absolutely zero. It, for instance, it's probably impossible to create food without any kind of emission. So there will be some emissions. What we have to make sure is that we have enough nature left to pick up uh, the emissions that will still be there. Mm. So as important as uh, you know, building electric cars, it is to take care of the uh, Amazon forest because they come into the same 
uh, calculation about net zero. And of course, on top of that, you get a lot mm. of biodiversity benefit from looking after very biodiversity rich uh, forests. So given how essential it is to protect the, the rainforest around the globe, so will it be a goal of Norway to get more countries to pay money to you know, a, the Amazon Fund or a, a global fund for deforestation? Oh yes, bring it on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and it's happening, actually. I mean, this, there is a fast growth in country dedication to this. And we're also seeing philanthropic and uh, company, you know, private uh, money increasingly going into this because the, the recognition of forest in particularly, but it's not only forests, it's pitlands, it's sort of, it, it's uh, unspoiled nature uh, everywhere is sort of our best partners. I mean, I'm a great fan of industrial carbon capture and storage, as you've already heard from this interview. But we have to remember that what is way, way cheaper, much, much less expensive, is just to let forest be forest. And the, the only price is not to cut it down. They, they, they already do the job. It's called photosynthesis. It's well-proven technology. It was here before we came. So this works, but you just have to allow nature to continue to do it. And uh, that, and that's why we all all way back to when Jens Stoltenberg was our prime minister. This is now the Secretary General of NATO, but he was prime minister. I was in his government, and and um, and 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 we launched this idea of uh, significant contributions to rainforest preservation. And we're happy to see that that has been catching on, and that we have partner countries to also take this seriously and see this also a national effort that they want to contribute to. If we go back specifically to the Amazon fund, um, so what are the most urgent challenges that need to be resolved in your view? So, of course, what we need to recognize is that we, we need to help uh, assist the countries in question by finding alternative livelihoods for the people who used to be involved in deforestation. We have to make sure that they are able to produce enough food uh, that they're able to do more with less. I mean, the general trend now in technological development is to do more with less. I mean, we all know this. If you have a better insulated house, you use less energy, but you still have a warm house. And mm -hmm. same, like, likewise, in agriculture, you can actually get more out of the same land by newer techniques, for instance. So, so you know, you can't just say stop cutting. You also have to say, you know, what can you do instead? Uh, so it's both to find this. Uh, one track is to help, uh, you know, policing, control, oversight where we have also funded the major uh, global satellite program that helps everyone interested open access free uh, to see uh, almost in real time how forests are doing. And this is being very welcomed by many of our partners uh, so that uh, you, know, you can actually do policing and control and follow up, but also to help develop uh, all these uh, alternative sources of livelihood that is necessary to get the people um in these areas to be engaged and i'm happy to say that some of the most engaged partners we have on the on the ground are indigenous peoples who have been very worried about sort of industrial use of their ancestors lands and who are very eager to contribute to with their experience and wisdom on how mm -hmm. can you live uh, you know well but in a better partnership with nature mm -hmm. and given the you know the um, the uh as, as you as you mentioned, the the rainforest countries have formed a pact to demand developed countries to to pay uh, developed countries pay to help poor nations combat climate change and preserve biodiversity. So you know, joining forces to try to you know to to to, um, to join forces. So what are the prospects that this alliance can obtain what they want in your view? I, but I, I, I must say I welcome this development very much. I think it's uh, excellent. I, I really commend President Lula and Pedro and the others who started this. It's actually two tracks. It's one are the, all the Amazon countries mm. in South America, uh, uh, but then they again reached out. So in this Amazon summit I mentioned, they also invited uh, some of their African partners and Indonesia, who are the other. You know, it's basically Indonesia, the Congo Basin, and the Amazon, where you still have rainforest. So also building bridges south-south uh, is something I think is uh, long overdue and I support it and I think they're absolutely right in saying that uh, rich countries like ours have to contribute to this because it's part of the global quest. Remember, we always have to remember that it's just one atmosphere and, and the, 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 the fact that we're seeing severe flooding in China and Norway on the same day or severe drought in uh, 
uh, say India and, and Greece uh, on the same day uh, is it, because of the same global problem. It's not the Greek or Indian or Norwegian problem, it's a global problem. And, and, the, and the solutions have to be found uh, across. And, and this uh, forest preservation is an, an increasingly large part of it. And I, again, I like to repeat, this is good for climate because these are carbon sinks. It's also good for, um, for adaptation because having green areas, it helps us manage the, the changes that actually happens. Uh, and, and thirdly, it's very good to, to tick off uh, on our responsibility to take care of uh, biodiversity because so much is probably precisely in the same area. So it's a win-win actually to do this, mm -hmm. but it requires help. And I strongly support our friends in the, uh, on the receiving end here of demanding more. Mm -hmm. So we're approaching soon the end of our time, and so let's let's turn to see some questions that have just come in. Um, so uh, there's one follow-up question, based on your response related to no new fields in the uh, IEA 1.5 degree scenario, do you still believe it is possible to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees? Uh, yes, I do, but I think we have a very it's very hard we have to be very honest we have a very small window uh, and uh, as the international climate, un climate panel ipcc says you know if emissions need to go down uh, by the latest from 25 to 2025 globally and if if they don't start looking if we're not beyond the peak globally in 25 we will not make it to 1.5 so which again this climate summit is so important and and all the efforts that we're seeing but it has to be said we have seen we're, we're seeing the european green deal with its taxonomy its repower eu it's uh, uh it's, uh, um, it's very 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 systemic uh, transformation of every aspect of the economy we're seeing similar things happening in the us we now have uh, you know australia came late but very actively into this now with the current government there uh, canada japan south korea and china is actually also very much working in this in this direction now. So many of the key drivers of the economy are aware and on board. We just have to speed it up. And I think better coordination and cooperation, at least on this issue in a geopolitically difficult time, is important. And so far, it seems that the area that, I mean, I speak here as a former foreign and defense minister, as you mentioned, I'm now seeing that the area of global cooperation that goes relatively best is agreement on climate and biodiversity issues. Not to say good enough, obviously, because we see the results are not where they should be, but there's still room for global cooperation in these areas, which we cannot really say about, let's say, disarmament or uh, or trade policies, right? So, so it is still an area where people understand that this is such a common challenge to humankind that we have to look a little bit beyond the differences that we have on other questions. And if we also can now see if we now are seeing an emerging competition on being first and best in the green transition, as we're now seeing now, there is a fight about electric cars in China and Europe because both China, Europe, and the US wants to be leaders on electric cars. Uh, well, maybe it's not optimal from a trade policy argument, but it's a great thing to compete about, right? <laughs> if they want to compete about something, well, why not be best at electrification? Or, or why not be best at developing the most, sort of most circular economy? And if, if we make sure that countries, companies who purchase stuff are saying, we want to purchase from you if you have the lowest emissions. Uh, and then that seller says, yeah, well, now my sub uh, uh, deliverers also need to deliver. Then you create the chain that can actually change the world. And I, I believe it's happening. However, long answer to a good question. I am not yet certain that it happens in time. So we need to speed up. Okay. Um, and one final question, and I think we'll, we'll round off after that, is um, uh, the last question that, that come in from the audience. Um, do you think Russia's invasion of Ukraine will ultimately be remembered as helping or hindering the global energy transition? I have a very clear answer to that. Let me first say the Russia invasion is absolutely horrible, uh, unacceptable, and a massive violation of international law and should never happen. So there's nothing good about uh, uh, war. But it is true that the outcome is that the the recognition that, uh, for instance, not the least Europe, but Western countries in general, have to sort of speed up their 
uh, energy transition also because they not, cannot be remain dependent on uh, suppliers like Russia in the long run has clearly accelerated the plants that were already there and maybe with up to 10 years. I mean, there are some analysis saying that we that they've been making decisions over the last year and a half uh, that it would have taken 10 years to get without that situation. So it's been a, uh, um, it's been a time for grown ups to talk to, to get, talk about not only how to help Ukraine in that particular conflict, but also how to make sure that one gets less dependent and that has transmitted also into a recognition that um, Europe, for instance, needs to be more resilient on uh, on key elements of the green transition, uh, access to raw materials and rare earths and technologies like 5G and uh, and batteries and, and uh, everything that is related to where we want to go. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's been, uh, uh, it has actually had an effect of us accelerating change in the right direction. Uh, but from, but I would rather to see that that was accelerated by something else than a brutal war. So, Esther Mate, they were coming to the end of our time together. Uh, that's all the time we have for. Thank you so very much for speaking with us on the range of issues today. And thank you very much for the audience, who, for the great questions and for watching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gladys.